Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Roland Lammy. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Community Behavioral Health Association. And we are the state's uh, association of the 10 designated community mental health centers here in New Hampshire. So we appreciate you uh, joining us for this session and uh, in our collaboration with Kim LaMontagne. Uh, we uh, at the association started in 2001, we're a body that was created um, essentially to advocate for the sustainability of the community mental health centers. And we've evolved into a number of different uh, activities, including um, you know, studying our workforce, uh, looking for consistent ways to work with the Medicaid managed care entities, uh, collaborating with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, standing up new housing, standing up uh, rapid response, uh, and a number of other activities that have occurred over the years. Um, we appreciate you joining us in this um, important month in Mental Health Awareness Month in the month of May. And we have a calendar on our website at www.nhcbha.org that will um, give you um, an events calendar for uh, other activities that are occurring in this month. Um, at the association, we have seen a dramatic rise in uh, attributed populations and people with mental illness needing care over the past several years. Uh, the pandemic in particular has highlighted issues with children, but it's also highlighted issues in uh, the workplace and with adults, um, you know, from everything from uh, burnout to dealing with home issues to dealing with uh, changes in the daily schedule, uh, virtual work, uh, isolation, and those types of things. And so uh, we think that this event with Kim uh, LaMontagne is a, a particularly important subject to talk about. Um, Kim is an international speaker, a corporate trainer, and an author. Um, she has her own experiences of challenges in the work, workplace, and as a part of that experience, um, she created a solution called the Four Pillars of Creating and Sustaining a Mentally Healthy Workplace Culture. And so we're pleased to have her here today to talk about uh, this important issue. Um, her mission is to share her experiences and teach leaders how to create a culture that engages individuals to speak openly about mental health. And so uh, with that, I'm really, really pleased to uh, introduce Kim uh, for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes of this session. Thank you, Kim, please take it away. Wonderful, thank you so much, Roland, for that introduction. And it is an absolute honor to be here with everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And just a little bit about um, what we'll be going through today. Uh, so I will be sharing a little bit about my own personal story, my own personal journey through navigating mental health in the workplace. And then I will take you through an introduction, an overview of what those four pillars are for uh, leaders to really begin creating a mentally healthy workplace culture. So again, it is an honor to be here and to collaborate and partner with the New Hampshire Community Behavioral Health Association. So this slide right here, it shows you three versions of me three versions of me throughout my journey of recovery. Now on that picture on the left, that was taken in 2009, and it was just before I entered into my journey of sobriety. But my story is that I was a high performing corporate executive who for many, many years lived behind a veil, a mask of high performance in the workplace to hide the fact that I was living with alcohol misuse, major depression, anxiety, persistent and crippling suicidal thoughts. And I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified to speak openly about it in the workplace because I feared being judged, losing my seat at the table, damaging my professional integrity, and also losing my job. So I remained silent. And during that time, prior to entering into my, um, my journey of sobriety, again, I was a high performer in the workplace. And one instance I'd love to share with you right now is I won the Director's Choice Award at a sales meeting prior to 2009. 
And I deserved that award. But at the same time, I felt like a complete imposter. Because although I was receiving accolades for being the leader, the trailblazer, the out of the box thinker, the one that people went to for help, navigation and guidance, no one knew that behind all that and behind my smile was a girl, a person who was crumbling, absolutely crumbling at the seams. But yet I got up every day and I performed because I was too ashamed to let people see the real me. So on July 16th, 2009, I actually entered into sobriety. I made the phone call that changed and saved my life. Um, actually, I didn't finish. So when I won that Director's Choice Award um, at that corporate sales meeting, I accepted it. All my team, we went out and we celebrated, like we always do at sales summits or at corporate parties. But in true fashion, what happened is that I had too much to drink that night because my typical dose of alcohol every single night, never during the day, but every single night was five, six, seven, eight glasses of wine, followed by blackouts and hangovers. And on the day that I won Director's Choice Award, that was no exception because after a night of celebrating, the Director's Choice Award recipient myself does not recall getting back to my hotel room. Consequently, I never notified my husband at the time that I was safe in my hotel room. So I instilled panic in him, which led him to going onto my company website and finding contact information for all of my coworkers and my director. He then reached out to each and every one of them in fear so I woke up the next day with over 30 text messages and phone calls on my phone. And I also learned the next day that there was a fire alarm in that hotel and the entire hotel evacuated except for the Director's Choice Award recipient because I was passed out in my room. That was typical for me. Behind the scenes, off hours, that was typical for me to consume a great amount of alcohol each and every day. But that also led to my shame. So again, on July 16th, 2009, I called my doctor's office at 445 in the afternoon, made an appointment, was seen at 515, and I met the most kind, compassionate nurse practitioner one could ever ask for. And he said to me, Kim, you are living with co-occurring disorder. You have actually multiple things going on here. I am going to help you and we are going to do this together. So I'm coming up on 13 years of sobriety in July of this year, but the sober journey was anything but easy. So that photo in the middle, I want you to really take a look at that because that was in 2016, excuse me, 2013, four years into my sobriety. That photo was taken for an Office 365 profile at my place of employment. My vice president asked all of us to put a professional headshot in our Office 365 profile. I didn't have a professional headshot, so I took that in my kitchen. That day was the most crippling, paralyzing, awful, horrific, suicidal days in my life. And I want you to really look at that. And if you're a leader or everybody here today, I want you to really look at that photo because I personally was a master at hiding behind a smile. <clears throat> I was a master at being a chameleon in the workplace because I was too afraid to say anything. So that photo to me, every time I look at it, it brings up a lot of emotion for me because I know the truth behind my eyes and my smile in that photo. The photo on the right is me in 2019. I am happy, I am healthy, and I'm now really using my lived experience to teach leaders how to normalize the conversation about mental health. 
my story goes longer, my story goes deeper. There's so many different examples that I could share with you, but for the purpose of today, what I'd like to do is move into what I've learned, a little bit of information about the four pillars and how we can really begin shifting the culture. And I will tell you that this training is not meant to be triggering in any way, shape or form. However, when I do go through signs and symptoms, um, I want you to really think of it from your personal and professional perspective, as well as family, friends, and colleagues, because we must really understand the obvious symptoms and signs, but also the ones that the high performers, the, the folks who are maybe too afraid to, to step forward, what are those people showing in terms of signs and symptoms? So what I've learned throughout this entire process of staying silent in the workplace, finally finding my, um, my journey of sobriety. Um, in April 1 of 2020, I stepped away from my corporate job and I decided to create the Four Pillars program. And what I've learned is that my story is not unique, not at all. What is unique is that I'm willing to step forward and speak openly about the things that I, that I went through the things that I did that I'm not proud of, but other people may be experiencing as well. And I'm willing to share that story to help others. I've also learned that employees living with a mental health condition are rarely feeling like their workplace is a place of safety. What I mean by that, they don't feel, they're reporting to me that they're feeling that they don't feel safe speaking openly about mental health because the fear of the unknown, what happens if I come forward and talk openly about it? I've learned employees are afraid to ask for help for the same reasons that I was afraid of. They're afraid of retribution, judgment, job loss, being bullied. There's a lot of fear still in the workplace. I have also learned that stigma and discrimination thrive on that lack of knowledge. And we're going to go through an exercise today about how we can start to really decrease stigma. And it really comes down to the words that we use. I've also learned that leaders lead by example. They have the power to transform the workplace culture. You look at the CEO of Starbucks, uh, of uh, Cummins Engine, they are leading the way from the top in really committing and prioritizing mental health and well being and embedding that commitment throughout their organizational culture. And then the last thing I learned is that employees really do thrive when they are in a safe environment. <clears throat> so we're going to go through um, some uh, just some quick information about the four pillars, they are to recognize the impact of unaddressed mental health in the workplace, share the lived experience, change the perception of mental health and then create a culture where we all feel safe speaking openly about mental health. So here it is in numbers. And I want you to really think about this from your organizational perspective. One in five people will experience at least one mental health episode in their lifetime. How many people are in your organization? And how many people would that translate into in your organization? And then to ask another question, do you know who those people are who may be currently living with a mental health condition and too afraid to ask for help? Mental illness itself is more common than cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. And I want to ask you all, if you were diagnosed with cancer, diabetes, or heart disease, chances are you would speak openly about it to your employer and you would ask for accommodation and you would explore ways that you can remain productive and in the workforce while you're dealing with this condition. Mental illness is more common than all three of those conditions combined, yet people are still afraid to speak about it and acknowledge when they need accommodation or when they need help. Eight in 10 people, this came from the Partnership for Workplace Mental Health Survey. Eight in 10 people feel that shame, stigma, and fear of ramifications are reasons why they don't disclose living with a mental health condition. From my lived experience, absolutely. 
that was absolutely how I felt. I was petrified. 75% of medium to large organizations offer an EAP or an employee assistance program. Stigma, shame, and fear are the largest barriers to EAP usage. Now this next statistic is, is staggering because although 75% of medium to large organizations offer an EAP, the national usage rate is only three to 5%. What is the reason for that? We have fear, we have shame, we have stigma, we have fear of going to human resources to find out where the EAP information is located. There's fear of calling that phone number because we don't know what's on the other end of that phone. There's fear of confidentiality, yet organizations put these programs in place for utilization. So this is absolutely a key area that we can all really pay attention to and ask ourselves, how are we promoting our EAP? How are we promoting the services that we are offering to our employees? Or is it just something that we did to check off the box and it's in the employee handbook? If that's the situation, we definitely want to unearth that, unearth all of the resources and make them publicly available for everyone. Some additional statistics, people experiencing a mental health condition, they get rejected, bullied, the experience discrimination in the form of stigma, which leads to less than half of the adults in the United States that need services are actually getting those services. And then again, if one in five are suffering in your organization or living with a mental health condition, and maybe those people uh, could be bullied and you're not aware of it, or then maybe they're not stepping forward and they're part of that one half of the adults who is not receiving services. How is that affecting them personally, health-wise, in terms of engagement, productivity, performance? All of those things really come into play. And then lastly on this, on this screen is that mental health conditions are the leading cause of disability across the United States and the globe. So it makes business sense to really stop and ask yourself as a leader, how are we creating an environment where our employees feel safe enough to step forward and ask for help? <clears throat> so I wanted to share something that came up just recently. I did a training for uh, St. Anselm's College. And it was for one of their nurse leader certificate programs. And I also did a training for um, the, the Seacoast Chambers of Commerce. On both of those trainings, they were, they were all leaders, business owners, nurse leaders, they were in leadership roles. And I asked them, from your perspective as a leader, do your employees feel safe speaking openly about mental health in your organization? And the, the, the options for responses were either yes, no, or I don't know. What happened was amazing to me. Over half of the nurse leaders who I was training didn't know if their employees feel safe speaking openly about mental health. That's a large number of leaders who just are not aware. The business owners who were, who were in my training with the Chamber of Commerce, 64% of them said, I don't know. Now, if your answer is no, or if your answer is, I don't know, it's okay. There is, it, it, it comes down to someone asking you that question and really saying, wow, I, I really don't know. What comes, what's most important is what do you do about that to really change it? So I just thought that that was an important statistic to share. The next thing that I wanted to introduce to you and really um, show you the impact of is presenteeism in the workplace. A lot of people are not familiar with this concept. Um, basically, 
presenteeism is related to absenteeism. It's a cousin of absenteeism. So when someone is absent from work, they actually call you and say, I can't come in today. You're not expecting any productivity out of that person because they have acknowledged that they are not able to come in. But when someone is actually coming to work and not fully functioning because of an illness, injury, or other condition, that's what we call presenteeism. So basically, people are present, but not fully functioning. And I learned of this concept when I was doing my MBA capstone project on mental health in the workplace. So presenteeism is absolutely related to performance. And I know even myself as a high performer in the workplace, when I was not well, when I remained silent in the workplace and tried to navigate my mental health on my own, I could have performed at a higher level, but I literally performed as high as I could to make the numbers and exceed them. And then I would just back off and fall apart. But I knew that if I was healthy, I could actually perform more. So when someone's at work and they're not fully present, they're not concentrating as well. They're not fully engaged. They could um, experience errors or interaction with coworkers, customers, or clients. And then at the end of the day, it can actually result in turnover. So a couple of different industries that I'm working with that I really kind of, I absolutely focus on presenteeism with is the construction industry, the legal industry, and healthcare. In any industry, it's important that we are showing up fully but in industries where mistakes can be deadly. You think about in the construction industry, and if you have someone who is experiencing mental health challenges, maybe alcohol misuse on top of that or substance misuse, they're showing up, not fully functioning, not concentrating, getting up on scaffolding, and they have a greater risk of having an accident. It's the same thing in all workplaces. So presenteeism is incredibly important for you to be aware of. It is difficult to spot because remember, your employees are there. So many times we think our employees are there, they're fine. But are they truly fine? Are they experiencing some form of presenteeism? So the path to presenteeism, it can look different. But this right here is just could be your traditional path to presenteeism. So you start off by having a healthy and engaged employee. Then out of the blue, there could be a major life event or illness, or it could be an illness that has been there that is now just creeping up because of a, 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 a healthy, a, a major life event. That employee becomes overwhelmed. I can tell you that this is exactly the path that I took. I became overwhelmed, I became scared, I became full of shame and fear, so I didn't ask for help. My engagement decreased. I didn't become fully disengaged, but my engagement decreased. I came to work and I performed at a level of presenteeism. I performed at a lower level. The path forward is to really go upstream and find those people and open the dialogue, engage them in a peer support network, provide them a safe space where they can have an open conversation. You as the leader, if you're opening that dialogue, please know it is not your responsibility to counsel them, unless you're a professional counselor, but that should still be completely separate. But your role as a leader is really to create that safe bubble that safe container where that employee can truly say, you know what, I am not okay and this is what's going on. And you can sit down, empathize, truly listen to that employee and then crosswalk them to those dire services that they so desperately need. But it's about be really being aware of the signs and symptoms and what it looks like. So again, remember, this is not a triggering presentation whatsoever, but I'm gonna go through some of the signs and symptoms and you, 
you're probably all aware of all of these signs and symptoms, but I'm going to describe them in a different way. Maybe from my perspective, when I was a chameleon in the workplace. And you may want to look at these signs and symptoms and think of yourself personally, friends and family or colleagues. And know that if you're experiencing some of these signs or symptoms, it's okay. But I encourage you to speak openly about it if you need help. So signs and symptoms, someone who is withdrawn or sad. They don't have to be overly withdrawn. They don't have to be incredibly sad. When I was a high performer in the workplace, my way to withdraw was to not speak as much during my weekly team meetings. I was always a contributor. I started to pull back a little bit. I withdrew because I started to cancel meetings. I kept most of them, but there were just a couple during the week. It was like, my anxiety's through the roof, I can't do this. So it wasn't obvious that I was withdrawing, but to me, it was so obvious. So look for the little signs. Someone who is sad, again, they don't have to be desperate, but someone who is sad, it's okay to ask someone, are you, are you okay? And then follow it up two or three times with, are you certain that everything is okay? Because I'm here to help if you need any help at all. I may not fully understand what you're going through, but if you let me in, I can help get you to the right resources. Aggressiveness. <clears throat> I was never aggressive, but some people, if you're noticing a slight change in their behavior, it could be nothing. But the way I think of it is that if you see something, say something. I'd rather you overreact than not react at all and, and really look back and say, I wish I had said something. Isolated. Um, I was extremely isolated when I was at my worst, but I also worked as a remote employee. I lived by myself because my daughter was in college and I thought isolation was the best thing for me because it was quiet. Isolation for me was the worst because the only thing that I had was myself with my own mind. So pay attention to those who are withdrawing or becoming a little bit isolated. Mood swings. Again, I really didn't have mood swings, but they don't have to be huge mood swings. It doesn't have to be. Poor sleep habits. So are you noticing someone who's complaining about not being able to sleep enough, being too tired? I know for me, I was exhausted all day long for fighting with this brain up here. Yet I couldn't sleep at night because every hour on the hour, my fight or flight response would wake me up and my mind would just start going and going. So if people are expressing these little itty bitty signs, pay attention to them and ask them, is there anything that can, I can help you with? Poor hygiene and nutrition. Again, I was a remote employee, so no one noticed that when I got sober in 2009, I never said a word to anyone but no one noticed except for once a year when I showed up at our, our annual sales meeting that I had dropped a tremendous amount of weight. I was 5'7", and I got down to 111 pounds during my first year of sobriety because I was so sick during that whole year, but no one saw it. Inability to concentrate, decreased productivity, all signs that could be a sign that someone's having a problem. Intrusive thoughts, absolutely. If someone tells you they are having an intrusive thought, you act on that, you, you talk to them about that, you talk to them about it, you make sure you get them engaged because for me as a high performer, in my own personal story, my sister and I were having a conversation one day over coffee she was going through a horrific time in her life and I looked her right straight in the eyes and I said, don't you just feel like ending it all? You have so many problems on your plate right now. She said, Kim, I have never had that thought before. I was actually blown away by that because I believed that everyone lived with intrusive thoughts. 
So we need to go upstream and educate people that those thoughts are not normal. You may be having them and I understand that you're having them, but they are not normal. I believed for such a long time that they were normal. Increased alcohol use, obviously that could be a sign. Worry, fear. I used to live in 99.9% .9 fight or flight mode. I was always afraid. Now I live 99% in the calm mode, maybe 1% fight or flight. And then always, if you're seeing super increased productivity, that's great. But make sure that it's not covering up. It's not a veil of productivity that's hiding something else behind it. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you about <clears throat> is about stigma and peer support. So peer support in the workplace is incredibly important. When we feel safe, seen, heard, and understood, we feel more apt, more open, more welcome to sharing our own story because it normalizes the conversation by sharing that lived experience. Every single time I've done a training in person, virtually, and one training in particular, I was in uh, Houston, Texas in 2017, 150 senior vice presidents were in the audience in person, senior vice presidents of HR, talent development and nursing. And I shared my story about being the high performer. I shared my story about the director's choice award recipient, not remembering getting back to her room. I shared all of the everything. And then I taught them about mental health in the workplace. 13 senior vice presidents approached me after hearing my story and acknowledged that they wear a suit of armor to work every single day to hide the fact that they too are experiencing mental health challenges and or substance use challenges. So peer support absolutely normalizes a conversation about mental health. It can inspire someone to take the first step and ask for help. It can guide employees throughout their own personal journey of recovery. Remember, I got sober in 2009, but it wasn't until 2016, seven years later, that I spoke openly about it in the workplace. My, only my immediate family knew. So I never had a guide to help me through this journey. Sharing our stories dispels myths. I always thought to, um, you know, you have to be living under a bridge or homeless to have a problem with alcohol. That's not true. And again, peer support provides a roadmap of available tools and resources, encourages open dialogue, illustrates that we're not alone because that was one of my biggest lies that I told myself that I was all alone. It helps to break down barriers and also encourages that recovery focused language. So just quickly before we get into the next section, five things that you can do if you're wondering yourself, how, how do I support someone who's in distress? First and foremost, I want you to as a leader identify those resources that you can give to that employee prior to having this, this, the conversation. Know what you can do for that employee and not have a conversation and say, I'll get back to you. Come prepared to that conversation. Create that safe space so the employee knows that there's no judgment within those walls of that conversation. Use person-centered language, which we're going to get into. Listen with care. Not listen to respond, but listen with care and practice empathy and then crosswalk that employee over to those professionally sponsored services or employer sponsored services. So again, stigma and discrimination thrive on lack of knowledge and understanding. And why do we want to address stigma and how? So the benefits, you're going to have employees, if you are reducing stigma, reducing discrimination on all levels, but today we're talking about mental health, they're going to feel more included, they're gonna feel safer, seen and understood. They'll also begin to improve 
their personal, social, and occupational functioning because they're feeling seen and heard. And as a result of that, they're going to feel more engaged, which will then improve their service, their skills, more favorable coworker interactions. It will decrease absenteeism and presenteeism, and then decrease that productivity just by shifting the language, shifting the culture, and changing the way we talk about mental health in the workplace. So I mentioned person-centered language, and I'm sure many of you here today are familiar with person-centered language. Um, if you're not, I'm gonna take you through that. So discriminatory language that many people use who aren't aware that we're actually using discriminatory language. So words like addict, lunatic, nuts, junkie, alcoholic, crazy, psycho, going postal, I hear in the healthcare industry, nurses many times use that phrase, frequent flyer. Those are words that are covered in shame. Committed suicide. That's another phrase that we are shifting away from. And what we're shifting to is that person-centered language where the person is at the center of everything we talk about. So it's a person living with a mental health condition, a person living with substance misuse or alcohol misuse or bipolar or a person in recovery, a person with that lived experience. I no longer call myself an alcoholic. I did when I first got sober because I didn't know anything about person-centered language. So yes, I called myself an alcoholic, but I don't use that word anymore. And I wanted to show you a, a photo, which I came across on Facebook. I just, this hit me the wrong way. And it really just shows the power of words. So I cropped it out so the, the people can't be seen, but I look at the phrase that is on that t-shirt. We are not alcoholics. They go to meetings. We are drunks. We go camping. 13 years ago, I might have chuckled at that shirt. Now I think that is the exact reason why stigma and discrimination is perpetuated because of the words that we're using. So if we want people to be open in the workplace, we need to begin embracing that person-centered language, applaud people for coming forward and saying, I am so proud of you for acknowledging that you are experiencing challenges and I see you as a person first, and I, as your leader, am going to make sure that I give you every resource possible to help you through this, but I just wanna say I'm proud of you. Those conversations make a huge difference. So the last section before we get into some questions um, would be really, you know, in the leadership role, how do we create that culture of safety? And what does that look like? A culture of safety is a phrase that I came up with that really is a phrase that describes an organization where employees feel safe speaking openly without any fear of retribution, judgment, or any type of job loss. Because once again, one in five people in your organization could be living with a mental health condition. Eight in 10 out of them could be afraid to speak openly about it. But when they're feeling safe and when they know that their leaders are not their counselors, but their leaders understand what mental health or mental illness is and what it's not. And when leaders are empowered, instead of being afraid to enter into the conversation about mental health, it changes the, di the dynamic of, of the culture. It changes the dynamic of the organization. And in a safe workplace environment, there needs to be varying levels of safety. So psychological safety, that is a huge piece of a safe workplace environment. Employees need to feel 
psychologically safe, that they're not going to be punished for speaking openly, contributing to the organization, um, speaking freely about, you know, what's going on with them. Um, psychological safety increases engagement and productivity because people feel safe in that safe bubble within the workplace. Of course, we need physical safety in our workplace, emotional safety as well. We also need to feel included. We need understanding, empathy, and then also peer support. Those are really all key ingredients in a safe workplace culture, a culture where people feel safe stepping forward and saying, I'm not okay. So how do we do this as leaders? You know, the, the first step is really to recognize that employee mental health is a top priority. Um, I just touched on statistics. There's a ton of other statistics that are out there, but we must recognize that employee mental health, not only is it good for the bottom line, but it is good for humanity and for your employee well-being. So we must embed that commitment, that leadership commitment to health and well-being in all communications, and it must come from the top. I, um, one of my uh, good colleagues or good friends is Bob Quinn, the Commissioner of Department of Safety. He oversees 1,700 employees from state police, fire, EMS, 911, DMV. And he created an office of wellness and resiliency at the Department of Safety. And I helped um, review the policies that they were putting in place for that um, wellness and resiliency program. And he called me one day and he said, Kim, we're gonna be rolling out the wellness program and I want all of my leaders in every single division to do a personal video and share it with their people within their division. What's the biggest message that my leaders need to, to put forward? And I said, well, I think the biggest message is that you are committed to creating a culture where employees will not be judged if they step forward and ask for help. They need to focus on the fact that the commissioner of the Department of Safety is committed to creating a culture of safety where everyone can speak openly about mental health. So we did that and all of his leaders did that. That right there was, was huge. And then he's followed it up with many other activities, but it came from him. It went down through all of his senior leaders, went down through all of the managers, directors, everything. But the message came from the top. Cisco Systems did, something very similar. The CEO of Cisco sent an email out to all employees. I think it was 70,000 employees acknowledging the mental health and the, the fragile state of mental health in corporate America. And he empowered his employees to step forward and speak openly. Within one hour of sending that email, he, received, he personally received over a hundred email responses from employees. It came from the top. The next thing that we must do is train leaders. I hear from leaders so frequently that they are afraid to open up the dialogue because they don't know what to do. So therefore, they don't open that dialogue and things spiral out of control. So it's about training leaders to understand the signs, the symptoms, how to decrease stigma, the inclusive language, and how to build that culture of safety. The next part of a mentally healthy workplace culture is to really create that peer support network. Identify peer support champions and really work through building out um, a, an entire peer support network where people who have enough time in their journey of recovery and who are able to step forward and share their story, not everyone is, has the ability to do that. But peer support not only helps the person who is in need of the support, but peer support helps the person like myself heal as well. Because every time I train, 
it helps me heal because I know that my story and my content and information is helping others. Uh, we must shift to person-centered language. We can no longer have conversations that involve discriminatory, stigmatizing words. We can no longer refer to colleagues as he or she is bipolar. No, that's a person living with bipolar. He or she is psycho. No, that, that's a person living with mental illness or a person living with alcohol misuse. Shifting and embracing person-centered language is incredibly important. And that really does lead to creating that safe workplace culture where everyone feels safe stepping forward and speaking openly about mental health in the workplace. So with that, what I'd like to do is really kind of open it up for questions at this point. I like to get through all the content first to make sure I can hit it all. Um, I would like to open up the um, open up for questions. My contact information is up on your screen. You're welcome to reach out via email, go to my website, follow me on social, connect with me, let's have a discussion. But for the Q&A session, please know that there is no question that is off limits. Um, I'm an open book, very transparent, and I welcome all of your questions uh, and feedback. So I'll stop sharing so we can start to see everyone on the screen again. <clears throat> Kim, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. And I know that um, uh, we had some questions more about just asking if we were recording it and that people either came on late or had to leave early, uh, wanted to share it around. So we did record it. So, and, and I think you had talked about, this is the kind of webinar um, and conversation that um, you kind of process and that oftentimes people will email you after the fact. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I had a question. You mentioned that there are, you know, three industries that you've honed in on. You know, are there any other industries that are also susceptible um, or is, you know, for everybody, this is just across the board? You know, it's it's across the board. Um, I do presentations with John Broderick on a regular basis um, and the former chief justice, New Hampshire Supreme Court. And it he always says, Addressing mental health in the workplace is no longer a nice to have, it is a requirement. And the, the people who are coming into the workforce right now, they are, they're demanding it because they know how important it is. And when I first started my journey, I really expected to spend the majority of my time in healthcare, but all of these other industries started to come forward, but it's especially those industries, the legal industry, there's a lot of perfectionism in, in that industry. They are trained to win. They are handling cases that involve an outcome that can change a person's or a family's life. They are on the hook for incredible amounts of debt. They're not able to make mistakes. There's so much within that field that I never knew about that I'm learning about. Same for healthcare. Healthcare professionals have been having a very difficult time. Um, but I think it's across every single industry, but especially those that are male dominated, which is unfortunate because statistics show that women are more apt to step forward and ask for help than men and men, there's no shame, zero shame asking for help. Um, so I would say heavily male populated industries for sure. And then those industries that are uh, really filled with the type A perfectionist style personalities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another great question here. Um, so this is from someone from the audience. Do you have tips for people seeking employment? For example, if someone wanted to disclose a mental illness during the hiring process and ask about accommodations. Mm -hmm. So that's always a tricky one. Um, but honestly, um, from my perspective, if you have a, a mental health condition and you do disclose that and it is you know very well managed and you're asking for accommodations that are reasonable and you're not giving those accommodations to me that's a high that's a red flag that maybe that's not the organization that you're meant to be at um so it is still a tricky situation from the hr perspective because there's still a lot of people reach out to me still um that they've gotten demoted or um, lost a, a job because they disclosed. So you have to feel comfortable disclosing and to what level. 
Um, but I think it's absolutely, you know, okay to be able to demonstrate that this is under control as long as you have these accommodations and if they're reasonable and if there are accommodations that's no more than someone who has a physical ailment that they're you know um, able to accommodate their response will give you a good insight into their culture of mental health prior to you even starting in that organization okay thank you for that another one here they're just more are coming in uh, if someone is showing signs, how do we breach the subject without putting the person on the spot? Yeah, that is, that's a tough one. And it really all depends on the person themselves. Uh, but you as a leader, you know your employees' personalities. But honestly, it would be, I just wanted to have a conversation with you. You know, pull the person aside. It's nothing that you want to do in public. And I would make it a kind of a blanket statement that I am committing to being more observant and making sure that every single person on my team is okay. So you're not singling out that person. And I just wanna make sure that everything in, is okay with you. And if it's not, it is okay to actually have a conversation. Now, many times I always say two of the most dangerous words on the planet are actually four, I'm okay and I'm fine because there's so much behind those two phrases. So if someone says, you know, I'm fine or I'm okay, no, I'm good. It's okay to follow it up by saying, are you truly okay? Even if it's something small, medium or large, I may be able to give you an answer. I may be able to help you, but it's okay to actually speak about it. So it's about really creating that, that bubble of safety, not singling out the person, letting them know that there's nothing wrong with them and that you are there to help them and to guide them. Um, another way you can ask is on a scale of one to 10, one being horrible, 10 being great. How do you feel today? And if someone says, oh, well, I feel like a, a six, Okay, well, that, that's good. So instead of asking, you know, what would make them get to a 10, maybe say, well, what's one thing that you can do to bring yourself up to a seven? So it's, again, you're not pointing the finger at the employee, but you're asking them, honestly, where do you sit on that scale? And you're not asking them to make that big leap to 10, but what's one small thing that you can do to get to that next level, number seven? That's great. Um... We have another great question here. I mean, these are all great. Do you think that the remote work has elevated some of these issues? And how do you address someone working from home who you believe is using drugs or alcohol while working? This seems to be more common. Ah, okay, while working, okay. I definitely think that the remote work has heightened um, our, um, or increased the, the mental health uh, the number of people who are experiencing mental health challenges and also substance misuse. Uh, interestingly enough, I just saw an article yesterday that said that alcohol sales are down year over year uh, because of inflation and people are shifting their spending. But at the beginning of the pandemic, the sales were th uh, through the roof. So with remote employees, it is more challenging. I can speak from experience. I hid behind my, my technology. I could write an email with great personality and and um, you know, wonderful words, but behind it, it, it was anything but wonderful. So it's about checking in on your remote workforce. Um, in terms of if they are using during the day, um, if they're drinking or using substances during the day, that would be something that I would involve HR in. I'm not, I'm not in the HR space, However, um, that's something that would be against company policy. You're not just calling them out and saying, I wanna give you help. They could be potentially breaking rules within your organization. So it does deserve a conversation, but I would 100% work with your HR to find out what the exact legal steps are for you to take in that conversation versus just asking someone if they're okay. It's a big difference. Yeah, there's a line there. Um, 
So another one, are there recommended standards for employee benefits to support mental health days? I am finding that more and more organizations are actually um, doing a few things. They are um, acknowledging or they're giving people extra vacation time to accommodate mental health. Some organizations, I even noticed that they did a, a whole week, one week shutdown to focus on mental health. Um, you can with your employee assistance program. I didn't know this until I think it was Cummins Engine. Um, their uh, chief wellness officer, I, he was part of a, a panel that I was on and he actually worked with his employee assistance program and negotiated a better plan where instead of having eight sessions per diagnosable condition with the employee assistance program, they doubled it to 16. I didn't know that you could actually do that. Um, so yes, I am seeing that the, um, that employees or excuse me, employers are actually expanding and allowing for mental health days. Um, because the conversations are there and people are actually coming forward and acknowledging that this is something that's incredibly important. But I wouldn't just stop at that. I would also look at the health insurance, make sure that you have a solid mental health um, portion to your, your health insurance. Look at that EAP. Are you just offering just the standard services? Is, is there anything else that you can bring forward like additional um, additional counseling sense, uh, sessions or on-site um, information sessions from the employee assistance program. So there's a lot of different things that you could do in that arena. That's great. Um, well, it looks like we are right up against the hour. Um, and so Kim, I didn't know if you had any last words um, as we close out, just in regards to if anybody else wants to reach out where they can reach you. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate so much that uh, you brought this conversation forward. And I'm thrilled that there were so many people here today. It just really illustrates how important this topic is. And I just want to say that it's really up to all of us as leaders to lead the way and to create change in the workplace, because the statistics show that it is in every single workplace. Um, so this is critical. I am so grateful that you are all here. I would most likely anticipate that I may hear from some of you personally, and that's okay. I welcome that conversation. I'm not a counselor, but I welcome it. Um, but if you'd like to reach me, you can reach me via email at kim at kimlamontaine.net. You can go directly on my website, kimlamontaine.net. There's free downloadable resources for you up there on stigma, the power of language, common problems. Those are all free. And there's also um, a place where you can book a consult if you'd like to have a further discussion about uh, maybe bringing the four pillars, the entire training to your organization, or if I could support you in any way. This conversation is so critical. Yeah, thank you again for doing this with us, with uh, SIBA, the community mental health centers across the state, our, um, our chambers, chamber of commerces. There was a lot of people on this, and I think it's a very important conversation that not everybody knows how to navigate. So um, for those who are wondering just, you know, again about the recording, we're gonna put this up on uh, Facebook. This is gonna be on our Voices for Mental Health Facebook page. We'll also find another way to get it to those who are looking, um, looking to kind of review it, review it with um, employees or, you know, anybody else. But um, thanks for joining us all today. Um, again, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, you can go on to the SIBA website to find out some other events. And um, Kim, thank you again so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.